And we will pause. Okay, good. Using open wire line in forbidden places. There are lots of places people, places, hams figure they should not use open wire line. I'm here to tell you that most of them are not forbidden and can be used very successfully. So I'm going to show you tonight where open wire line has never gone before. Playing here on the <laughs> on Star Trek, of course, who many of you are probably like me, a fan of here. Here's the Enterprise uh, hovering over a, a distant planet, going where no man has gone before or person has gone before. But we're going to take you where no open wire line has gone before, at least for most hams. In the early years of ham radio, of course, open yeah. wire line was king. We can see here before we even had K's and W's in front of the station. Here's station three ABG using undoubtedly ladder line and uh, an open wire antenna, maybe not a rhombic, but who knows. And open wire line, of course, is still used today in many cases because of its uh, low loss characteristics. And it certainly is. Here's a, here's a sort of caged open wire line. And uh, it's still, there's still uh, frequently used here and there. I remember seeing the open wire lines over at Radio Luxembourg years ago when I was traveling through Europe there and saw them one foot apart, the conductors were on ceramic insulators out in the field. But today, generally speaking, we hams prefer coax. You might ask, what caused the changeover from open wire line to coax? Well, it was frankly portable radios to a large degree, making radios smaller and so forth, where open wire light wasn't as handy as coax. There's a couple of German soldiers in trench, with trench radios, but coax was much, much handier to run RF around in. And right after the war, uh, companies like Amphenol began to make coax readily available to hams. And hams began to use it because of its shielding properties principally. And that's why we liked coax. And Amphenol, of course, was the company that probably most made it popular and made Testing it really one, two, three. Somebody's got an open mic there, testing. Okay, good. So it was basically after the Second World War when uh, when coax really hits the ham world. It had it was pretty much the war that uh, caused it to to be used extensively. And of course, today we still find it in use. Of course. Many hams may use 300 ohm TV ribbon cable, which you see there at top, or we more probably more commonly use 450 ohm slotted ladder line, which you see there at the top. Although some hams are up to building their own ladder line or buying 600 ohm ladder line, which you can see there. There's an interesting product out there, if you're not aware of it, called Ladder Snap. I have uh, quite a bit of it. It's, these are molded plastic pieces that you can use yourself with just some uh, just some solid copper wire, and they just snap on the wire. Quite a quite a nice little product if you're not aware of them and if you're into using ladder line for uh, feeding your antennas with. I highly recommend the product. I don't make any money off of it, but I just like the product. Oh boy! I want to show you a chart here though, which is interesting to compare the losses of coax and ladder line and, and open wire line. And uh, there's something rather revealing here. Now, this is a, a chart for, the, for uh, the bands, 80 meters, 10 meters, 2 meters, and 70 centimeters. For 100 feet of each of these transmission lines and compare the various losses that you might see. Now, this is in a matched transmission line, which means you've got a perfect 50 ohm load at the other end of the line. It gets much worse if the load isn't uh, if the load isn't matched. But this is the these are the figures published that you'll find published in radio books. 
But I want to point out some things about uh, about open wire and lion and 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 and, and coax. Notice the losses. This is in dBi. This is uh, an actual uh, law, an actual dB loss. Notice how poor RG58 is. How much loss? For example, at 70 centimeters, uh, the loss is rather terrible at uh, at 440. RG8 is a good bit better, over twice as, I mean, almost three times as good as RG58. LMR400, which is uh, becoming many hams like to use it. I, I like to use LMR400, same size as RG8, four tenths of an inch in diameter. It's almost twice as good as RG8. But notice, lots of hams think that open wire line is lossless. No way, Jose. Open wire line of any kind still has loss in it. Notice the 300 ohm ribbon line there on the left. 300 ohm ribbon line, if you look at the figures there, isn't any better than LMR400 coax. You might think, oh, well, uh, 300 ohm ribbon line I thought was almost lossless. No, it's not. LMR400 is just as good. So if you think you're going to use 300 ohm ribbon line and have a lot better loss, think again. It can do just as well in LMR400 coax. You can see there in the gray. 450 ohm uh, ladder line is about four, about four times as good as either as either 300 ohm ribbon line or LMR400. But don't think that open wire line is lossless. It's anything but lossless. It's just lower loss than coax. All transmission line has loss. But hams like this guy here, <laughs> are afraid of open wire line. They think of uh, think of ladder line or open wire line as almost almost demonic. You know, they you know hesitate to use it because they figure they're going to make terrible mistakes if they use the open wire line and do things that are going to cause themselves not to get out or they're going to burn up their transmitter if they use it incorrectly. So it's not uncommon for hams to be afraid of open wire line, but I'm telling you, you don't need to be afraid of it. It's perfectly good transmission line, and uh, you can use it in places you never thought you could use it. And most hams think, this is pretty common ham thinking, they think that you have to use open wire line out in the open, like you see it there on the right, suspended in free space, or it won't work right, uh, or you're gonna, or you're gonna get a terrible amount of loss if you don't use it out in the open. And if you do mount it on something, you're at least gonna to have to put it in standoffs of some kind like this, or it's not gonna work right. That's the typical standoff for 300 ohm ribbon line there on the left. And a lot of hands believe if you don't, you want, don't do it one of these two ways, you can't use open wire line. That's not true. It's absolutely not true. Most hams would 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 pull up their skirts and roar off over the hill thinking never 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 would i ever do any one of these i would never lay open wire transmit mission line on top of a metal roof oh my god that would be terrible and heaven forbid that i'd ever think about putting it inside of putting it inside of metal conduits oh that would be terrible totally forbidden you know and they're even afraid of putting it over the edge of a metal window frame or even maybe putting it through a wall. They're afraid of doing that. And of course, nobody would ever lay open wire transmission line in a flower bed or lay it on the ground. And of course, worst of all, nobody would ever bury open wire transmission line. That's a total no-no. At least that's what a lot of hams think. I'm telling you, all of those are quite possible and are quite reasonable applications for open wire transmission line. And I'm gonna prove it to you. But can, so can we violate this common wisdom, which says never on the ground, never on a metal roof, never through walls, never over metal window frames, never buried in the ground, never in conduit. Those are not nevers. Believe me, they are not nevers. So I set out, I set out to find out 
And I'm going to just use very simple ham, method, ham methods here to find out whether those were no-nos. I wanted to know because I kept hearing these, these, pro, these prohibitions for, for ladder line that you got to use it in the open. You got to have it on big standoffs or it just won't work right. I wanted to find out, is that really true? And it isn't really true. In fact, I wrote an article back uh, in August of 2018 QS, uh, in QST, which you can get a copy of it just by going to the AWRL archive, and you'll get all of this information that I'm giving you here in this presentation. In that article, it was, it was published back then, but I, I thought it was a good enough presentation that it's worth repeating. So that's where you can get it, August 2018 in QST. There really are only two no-nos about using open wire transmission line in places that you do, normally don't think you can use it. You got to keep out the moisture. Moisture is a no-no in open wire transmission line. And you've got to keep it at a reasonable distance away from other objects, from the ground or from, uh, from metal frames and other things like that. If you do that, you can use it very well in these situations. Those are the two no-nos, and it's easy enough to avoid them if you just know how to do it. I'm gonna show you how to do it. First of all, let's take a look at moisture just to prove the point. Here's a, uh, here's a chart, a frequency, you can see one to 100 megahertz there at the bottom. So this is crossing the HF bands pretty nicely. In fact, these charts are for HF, these three graphs. The red graph is for is for 450 ohm window line. The red graph is for dry. You can see the losses in dB in dB over there on the left. Green is for if you've got frost on the line. You see the losses gone up, and you can see open wire 450 ohm open wire transmission line that's wet, and you can see that the loss is almost double. So you definitely want to keep open wire transmission line dry. That's an important thing to note. But if you keep it dry, you can use it in, in environments where surrounding the, the line is wet. But as long as you keep it dry from that environment, you're home safe. And here's the way to do it. Go down to your local hardware store and look for that gray foam. You've probably all seen it. It's the stuff they put on water pipes to insulate it. It's gray closed cell foam. It's made to go on a half inch copper water pipe. Usually it's got a slit down the edge. You slip it over the water pipe to keep water pipe warm. It's on warm water generally. It's called a closed cell half inch water pipe insulating foam. Readily available, it comes in 10 foot lengths. You can buy it for a few bucks at, uh, at any common hardware store. And it makes excellent material to, to, to do the two things you need to do to open wire transmission line, to keep it protected from the water and to keep it properly separated away from its environment so that it'll do its work and not give you a terrible loss. If you, in fact, if you put it in, as you see it here, here's some, it's got a nice three quarter inch hole through the middle, which is just the right size for three quarter inch slotted transmission line, 450 ohm line. You just slip it inside of that foam, and you can then, once you've got it inside of that foam, you can put it almost anywhere, and it'll work just fine. Lay it on the rafters in attics, lay it in your flower garden, put it inside of coax, put it inside of conduit, put it on metal roofs. You can put it all sorts of places. Lay it right on the roof of your house, and it'll work just fine. And I'm going to show it to you technically. You can tape the pieces together by just using some waterproof tape. Uh, good waterproof tape is readily available on the internet. So you can make as much of that much of that foam as you want to in length, in 10 foot lengths, you can run it for a long distance and just tape the ends of it together with waterproof tape. So you can make yourself a shield for this three quarter inch slotted ladder line very easily. So here is a simple test setup and this is just to estimate the loss. Now, I'm not trying to do laboratory standards here, but I'm just trying to prove the point that open wire line can work very well 
inside that foam in all sorts of places where you never thought you should ever put open wire line. And here's the setup. I used a little VNA, like the nano VNA. A lot of you've got nano VNAs. I used a little, a little VNA. And then I, I used a 50 ohm to 450 ohm ballot. Now, most VNAs are, are 50 ohm devices. So you have to do, I had to use a ballon to, to match it to, to a 450 ohm transmission line. Then I took a, a 10 foot length of 450 ohm trans, slotted transmission line. And I put a short circuit at the other end of it. Why did I do that? Well, a shorter transmission line, the signal from the VNA through the ballon properly matched to the 450 ohms of the transmission line, goes down the line, bounces off the short circuit, and gets 100% reflected back. Actually, you can use it twice as twice as long a line with an open circuit. It'll work the same way. But I use the short circuit. Works. It uses a shorter line, that's all. So, so a 10-foot shorter length of 450 ohm transmission line. Signal went down the line, reflected on, the, and then it reflected back. It, and then you can measure with the VNA a, a quantity called the return loss. Uh, any VNA will measure that. That's what I did. And so the loss is equal to one half the return loss in dB because it's going to pass down and pass back. So it's making two passes of the line. So the loss is actually half of the half of the measured return loss that you measured that you measure with a VNA. And here's the ballot. It's just three FT-240 mix-43 toroids. Those are the big 2.4-inch common toroids that you can easily get from all sorts of sources. And I want I buy, buy filer, filer wound it with a speaker wire uh, and I used two of them and hooked it up there so that I made a... I used three of them, as you can see, they're in a stack. I hooked the primaries, primaries in parallel and the, and the secondaries in series, which gave me a nine to, nine to one ballot, which is what I needed. So the input was hooked to the VNA on the left and to the ladder line on the right. So I get a proper match match to do the measurements with. Simple, simple little device to make it. And then I use banana plugs to connect to the uh, open line and the uh, SO239 uh, jack to connect to the VNA. And here's my test setup. You can see it. You can see the ball in there on the uh, on the ground in, in in all in all cases except the third one there. You can see the VNA sitting out there on the ground. It's a it's not the nano VNA. It's another little VNA. Uh, and you can see it's hooked to the uh, ball on one side. And then you can see the uh, the foam. And then the the ten foot of uh, transmission line is inside and it's short circuited at the other end. And I did it in these four different configurations. On the left, it's on laying right on the concrete of my patio. After I made the measurements of the return loss, I then moved it over into the into the, the wet soil right next to my patio, and that's what you see there. That's the ten foot of uh, of transmission of uh, open slotted line inside the foam, and you can see the tape on 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 the on the on the foam on the slotted line. And then the third one, I put it up on top of the aluminum roof of my pa of my patio there, right, laying right on a metal roof, which you'd never think you should do with, uh, with open wire line. And then finally, I went in and got some chairs and a stool, and I brought it up so I could get it up off of everything and make an open air comparison. And now you can see it. So I had three bad situations, as most hams would think, and one good situation with it. And there you can see the, ba the ballon hanging down there, hooking to the transmission line to the, to the VNA. And I made four sets, of, four sets of measurements and compared them. And here's the results I got. These are the, this is the raw data. You can't tell much from this raw data, but you can see they're all remarkably same. There's very little difference, as you can you'll notice. Remarkably little difference, as a matter of fact, between the amount of loss, that's the amount of loss on the left over there, between 2 and 30 megahertz, that's the HF bands, 
and you can and the dip what's the dip well that's the resonant length of the of the 10 foot of uh, of coax or 20 foot down and back uh, and that's the that's that's the resonant frequency of that length of transmission line that's why it's showing a dip there but you can notice how similar how how very much the loss in all of those four four different circumstances was almost the same which rather surprised me i was rather surprised how similar the loss was in all four of those circumstances. Three of them are circumstances that hams would never consider using. Only one was the one that most hams would consider using. Well, here's a little bar graph here, or a little uh, graph to show you how little difference there is between these four circumstances. In fact, open air is the black one there, was only minus one dB of loss. In fact, when I put it inside of metal conduit, and that was a piece of 10 foot long piece of two inch EMT, piece of two inch EMT, I shoved the, the foam inside and, and with, the, with the slotted line inside. And actually I got less loss from there, which surprised me. I'm not quite sure why, but um, probably, uh, probably who knows why maybe moisture or something and then notice buried buried underground i, I buried it underground the loss was only 0.15 db difference and on concrete was the worst actually and that's only 0.3 db that's trivial in a hundred feet of line this points out to this points out to point it out to me so, so dramatically. You don't need to fear using ladder line in adverse situations. With that foam covering it up, you can use it almost any place you can use coax. In fact, many of you may not be aware of this stuff, but there is in fact a a, a balanced transmission line, kind of transmission line that's available. It isn't used much anymore, but it's called twin axe. It's a hundred ohm balanced transmission line inside a jacket. This is much like doing what I was doing, uh, putting a, putting a, a open wire line inside of conduit. That's pretty much what this is. I got into this uh, some years ago when I when I designed this this off-center fed flagpole, which is being commercially sold these days. I don't have any interest in the company, but but uh, uh, when I developed this flagpole, it's uh, got two insulators, one at the base and one four feet up, and it's fed with open wire line that runs through my flower bed. And uh, it works very, very well indeed. I use these 3D printed spacers, which uh, which allow me to feed the feed the uh, open wire line up through the bottom four feet of this flagpole. The flagpole is a two inch is two inch aluminum pipe and the open wire line, as you can see the spacers, uh, hold it properly spaced away from. This is something similar. I could have used that foam. I, I hadn't uh, gotten around to using it at this time. This is why I printed these spacers. Uh, they, they do the same job as the foam. And you can see I bring the open wire line up to the to the to the the upper uh, the upper uh, spacer or the upper uh, gap in the uh, flagpole, and and then just feed it feed it out with some hookup wire to the two halves of the flagpole, and it works very very well. Some readers have sent me have sent me some examples of uh, of using uh, open wire line in in adverse situations. Uh, here you can see the foam on on the left, and this guy's got it buried in uh, in just PVC con and just PVC pipe. And that that works just fine. Got the foam inside a PVC pipe and got it covered up with soil, and, and it works just great. So, as a closing extra, let me show you just some uh, some quick slides here of where open wire line is still king. This is this is just fun stuff here. It's up at the ship to shore radio station, north of San Francisco at Point Reyes. Uh, this is the one of the two existing ship to shore radio, CW radio stations that still exist in the, in the US. One there at the Point Reyes and one at Martha's Vineyard uh, 
in uh, in uh, and, uh, on the East Coast. And uh, I took a visit to this station some years ago. In fact, you can visit it. Anybody can visit it anytime they like. Go up there at about nine o'clock Saturday morning, and they'll they'll take you through their transmitters and everything. And they still talk talk to ships at sea on CW six hundred kilohertz, and also on shortwave frequencies. You can see it's it's here just north of San Francisco. I and a good friend of mine, who's now a silent key, took a trip up there one day. Great trip to take if you're ever in the San Francisco area and just drive up there to the National Seashore Refuge at Point Reyes. And you can visit this last of the two remaining old CW ship to shore stations where all of the communications used to occur to ships. We're built by, R by RCA years ago. Here's the, the receiver site. They have a separate receiver and transmitter site separated by about 10 miles so they can transmit and receive at the same time and listen to themselves transmit. This is the receiver site. Here's my, here's the curator there on the right, Richard Dillman and my old old buddy who's now a silent key in front of the, the 500 kilohertz transmitter, which still goes on the air every week, every weekend at, uh, at uh, about nine o'clock in the morning. And you can tune in it. Tune, tune it in every every Saturday morning and listen to it if you've got re ability to receive uh, 500 kilohertz. And uh, that's my buddy, KE6YHG, who's now a silent geek, and Richard Dillman, the curator of the station. They broadcast on 500 and I think 6, 620 or something kilohertz. And they also broadcast on shortwave, six, six different frequencies. Here's their antenna matching devices feeding the open wire transmission line, which you can see going out through the window. And here is the open wire transmission line, which is about, about uh, 2,000 ohm transmission line going out through the window through, through uh, plexiglass windows uh, out through the transmitter building. In the early days, they had it on these little telephone poles, and that's, one of, that's the same building in the background. Here, here it is today. These are the open wire transmission lines that's feeding one of the 500 kilohertz antenna towers there in the background. And since I hold a second class radio telegraph license, they let me go on the air. And I was able to send out uh, a message on 500, and on 500 kilohertz and 620 kilohertz, as well as six CW, uh, as well as six short wave frequencies and I was able to listen to myself on the headphones coming back from the receiver site. And I was able, this is the only time I've ever been on the air with simultaneously with 18 kilowatts of CW. <laughs> so that was my, my one real high power experience. And they also have a ham station there, which you can tune into. So I thought I'd show you where, where CW is still king. So now you too can go with open wire line where no ham has gone before. And here's my little dog, Lolly. No, she doesn't have a German call sign. She's not D0GGY. I just like to present. You can get a hold of me at w6, w6mail at gmail.com if you've got any additional questions. And that's it, folks. Well, great, John. That was uh, really interesting. I have I have never really uh, had a, uh, that much appreciation for ladder line until tonight. It's pretty interesting. So uh, before we open it up to other questions, I do have one important question for you. <clears throat> so under what circumstances would you say, other than better efficiency, are there any sweet spots in terms of an antenna system design where a ladder line would be actually preferred over coax, other than just pure efficiency. No, just just loss in the transmission line. That's really about the only reason you would want to use open wire line. Is and if, you know, since 450 ohm slotted line, or if you want to go all the way to 600 ohm line, maybe using that ladder snap or making your own open wire line, you have a long, long run to your to your antenna. You might want to you might want to consider using open wire line because of its low loss characteristics, but if you want to invest in some of that foam, 
you can lay it on the ground or even bury the line. So now that you know that you can do that safely, because the the loss is the loss is non-existent. Mm -hmm. So you know, one thing that occurs to me is that the uh, 450 ohms seems to be, as you pointed out, a pretty good direct match to an off-center fed dipole, whether it's horizontal or vertical, yes. right? Yes. So one of the things that this affords you to do is to move the ballon, the nine to one ballon, to the rig side, to the rig end of your ladder line into your shack. If you have any issues about like if it's a home built and you want to keep it out of the weather or um, you sure. want, or you've got a tuner uh, with a built in ballon in it that some tuners do um, uh, or even a switchable or adjustable ballon, uh, you can you know, tweak it a little bit. And uh, it, it basically brings your, the feed point from your off center fed into your shack with great efficiency. So that seems to me to be a, a natural uh, uh, obvious advantage. Uh, the other question I had, John, is have you had any experience with common mode uh, noise on uh, uh, using ladder line? Well, ladder line uh, doesn't have a suffer from common mode noises. There's only differential mode in in open wire line. The right. common common mode noises occurs when you've got a shield on the outside of your transmission line, and uh, and uh, then that that's when you have common mode the current. But uh, the, you've got differential mode because you only got two wires and the signals are running differential in the two wires there there's no there's no outside of the shield which is the third conductor in coax coax is a three conductor system the signals are on the inside that you want and the shield is the outside and it's it's the where the, the current you don't want that's why you use a ballon so so what i hear you saying john correct me if i'm wrong is that on a coax one of the reasons why you have or could have common mode current is because you have current running through the center conductor, of course, and then you have currents running both on the inside and the outside surface of the braided shield. Is that correct? That's right. The braided shield is a cylinder, but the current in all conductors, RF, runs on the skin. So the current on the shield runs on the inside and the outside of the conductor. Skin effect separates the inside of the shield into two separate conductors. And that's what the ballon at the does. It separates the inside skin of the of the of the shield from the outside skin of the shield and cuts them off. That's why you need the ballon. That's what the I like to call them shield current jokes. I don't like the term ballon. Uh, to me, it doesn't tell you what it does. That's a shield right. current joke to separate the outside skin of the shield from the inside skin of the shield where the action should take place. There should be no action taking place on the outside surface of the shield. But there is if you don't have a, a choke there at the end or a, as we call them ballons, which is to me a, a misnomer name. I don't like the name ballon, but it's we've got it. We have to, that. I think a ballon is a misnomer. Line isolator or common mode choke would be a much more appropriate term for that because that's what it is. They're a common mode, common mode, or a shield current choke. Current choke. It's a current choke, and balance and unons are a voltage uh, transmission line transformer, yep. uh, a Ruth Roth basically design as opposed to uh, a Guanella uh, type uh, right. current choke. You're, you're right. So that's interesting. You know, um, yeah, Charlie, go ahead. Yeah, uh, since we're talking about balance, John, I noticed uh, that on your um, uh, picture of the uh, ballon that you used, the nine to one, you had three torrids in there, and then each individually one, each individual torrid had the wire wrap on it. How many wraps did you do on each torrid? Well, uh, that's a kind of a, a long story. I mean, you want to you want to <laughs> get enough uh, want to get enough wines on. I used. Uh, I used a, a basic simple calculator. I do a whole I do a whole talk on how to build ferrite balance. 
Oh yeah, I I am familiar with that, and and I was just kind of curious because I've never used three in. I guess you would call it series. Well, you hook the you hook you hook the primaries of the of the toroids uh, in parallel. Oh, okay, and, so it's in parallel. So you'd you'd wrap one toroid as a nine to one, and then you do the other two as a nine to one, and no, then hook them in. in... The, the, to, the the toroids are round as one to ones. Oh, okay. The three one to ones with the primaries hooked in par parallel and the secondaries hooked in series, and the whole thing ends up as a, a as a nine to one. One. Okay, I think I got that. Yeah. Okay. Just, just as a quick note for everybody, and that is the the impedance ratio in this case a nine to one, going from fifty to four fifty or vice versa. Forty nine to one. Is a nine to one. On, on Alan, either way, uh, is based on a turns ratio of three to one because yeah. the impedance ratio is always the square of the turns ratio. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's how it's built, and that's why you have three toroids. Yeah, three mm -hmm. toroids is the turns ratio is three to one. Impedance ratio is nine to one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Who else has some questions? We got a little bit of time left. Speak up now. Go ahead and unmute yourself and speak up. Yeah, just keep that coax, just keep that open wire line dry and spaced away from the uh, from the environment by a reasonably small distance. And you can put it anywhere. Put it absolutely anywhere. Through walls, over window frames, in in flower beds, on metal roofs, up on top of your house. It, you know, you don't have to you don't have to hang it out in free space. <laughs> Okay, so I have another question then, John. Um, we've seen ladder line at 300, 450, 600 ohms. Is, is that determined primarily by the, uh, the kind of insulator that is used to separate it and the spacing of the conductors? The impedance of open wire line is determined primarily by two factors, the diameter of the conductor and the spacing between them. There's a yeah, you can look up the formula. It's a pretty simple. But those are the two variables, the diameter of the conductor and the spacing between them. And if there's any dielectric present, of course, that's going to alter it. But open with air air line, since air has a has a permeability of one. So uh, so that's basically uh, I, I don't have the formula in my head. It's uh, it's some squares and square roots in there, but I don't uh, I don't know what it is, but it's a pretty simple formula. Uh, for the impedance, uh, for the uh, yeah, the impedance of the uh, the the surge impedance of the transmission line. So it sounds to me like if you're running a lot of power, and you're running feed lines for quite a distance, like hundred feet or much longer than that, open ladder line could be a real advantage. Oh yeah, particularly if you're up at fairly high frequency, you know, if you've got a if you look at if you, we go back to the table that I showed you there of the loss at, yeah. even at ten meters, there's pretty good loss in a hundred feet of coax. Interesting. All right, guys, here's your chance to ask the expert on ladder line. <laughs> I'm hardly an expert, but I was surprised at the results of those simple tests. <laughs> Okay, guys. Well, that was fun. I uh, enjoyed doing that, and uh, and uh, glad to have you back. I'm always working on new projects, and uh, my uh, I'm having my website is kind of a, a mess right now. I need to get do a lot of homework on it on it, but uh, I'm always putting up new materials. We've uh, got a, a new presentation on homebrew homebrew designing Yagi antennas. You know, most hams are afraid of Yaggies too. They don't think they could possibly design a Yaggy for themselves. They think only a high-powered engineers can design Yaggies. I've got a talk that shows you how to how to get a 98% Yaggy that's as 98% as good as the most high-powered engineer near can design with three simple rules. No calculations, no calculators, no nothing. Just go out in your garage and build it. You know, that's a good one that I'm doing. And uh, let's see what else do I I do. Uh, it's anyway. Also, the uh, talk on on plastics. You know, a lot of a lot of uh, hams uh, build build antennas from scratch or and uh, employ 
various plastics in the building of the antennas. Well, there are a lot of plastics that we use, or maybe, maybe you're a 3D printer. 3D printing is growing leaps and bounds in the homebrew community of ham radio. And, uh, and it, it, it behooves the builder of, of, of antennas that, who are 3D printers to know which plastics to use because some of them are not good for RF environments at all. We learned some very nasty lessons about which plastics to use and which plastics not to use if the parts you've been are gonna go into an RF environment. So that's another talk that uh, is newly available. So John, well, are you saying that uh, plastic has an RF uh, interference with us? No, it's just, it's just certain plastics will melt very easily oh, in an oh, RF. You mean heat when we used to burn our hands. Okay, I got yeah, it. Yeah. Well, it, it's due to the fact that some plastics are what are called polar plastics, yes. and some plastic plastics are called nonpolar plastics. And uh, the polar plastics heat up very readily in an RF environment. For oh, example, no. for example, nylon is not a good plastic to use if you're going to put it into an RF field. And it, it, and uh, we, we had some bad example in building up. Uh, exciting uh, molecules can be fun. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and uh, of course, I do a lot of stuff on magnetic loops. And that's oh, probably yeah. the, the most popular of all my talks. <laughs> Very the, good. Very I'm good. The, I'm the demon of the blog site on mag, on mag loops. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, very good. Rudy, do you have any last comments before we go? Yeah. Let me ask John, can you please, do you have a slide of your contact information? Uh, John is, remember, he's Whiskey 6, November Bravo Charlie, NBC, like the, uh, like the station. You can get a, you can get my, my website is my is W6NBC, my call sign, dot com. Yes. And most of the information you'll need will find it there. But if you want to email me and I'm readily available anytime, it's just my call sign W6NBC mail, M A I L, at gmail.com. W6NBC mail at gmail.com. That's very simple and a very good way to do it, John. Excellent. Yeah. Okay, guys, it's been fun. We'll say 73 to you and, and uh, maybe. Maybe give you another talk down the line here. Somewhere. Yeah. Thank you very much, John and Rudy. Any parting remarks? How are we doing on antenna? Uh, are we going to do some more antenna talks this month, this year? Well, you guys uh, need to speak up and tell me what kind of topics you want to hear about. So all the best. You got it. We will do that, Rudy. And we've got the meetings to go to. So right. excellent. Mr. Wiedemann, it is a pleasure as usual. K7RAW, thank you very much. And everybody else on the call, you've been very quiet for a group of hams, which is just amazing. Ron, I'm ashamed of you. Anyway, <laughs> everybody have a great week and we will catch you on the radio. Thank All you right. very much. Thank you. Good evening.